<laughs> well, who's excited to open gifts tomorrow or give gifts? A few of you? Yeah? Lily, are you excited? You excited for gifts? Uh, <laughs> she's ready. Uh, gift giving is something that people have always done throughout human history. Every place, time, and culture, it's a universal human experience. Uh, and of course, Christmas has always been an important time of generosity uh, to friends and family members and to the poor as well. It's been so cool seeing so many of you uh, and your generosity during this season uh, to, to so many great causes and people. And when we think of Angel Tree, some of you got gifts for those in, uh, for, 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 for inmates, for children of inmates. And then the Christmas baskets for those struggling in our community, a, a meal and some presents. Uh, we think of shoe boxes for children around the world that you guys sent or supplies for the faith house wreaths uh, for, for the women fleeing uh, bad situations. And, and of course, the countless cards and baked goods that you dropped off on my doorstep. Uh, the many Christmas calories, uh, some serious, serious ones. So, you know, I was thinking about this. Why do we give gifts on Christmas? Uh, one of the reasons, uh, like we think of Santa Claus, right? And Santa Claus is actually a deeply Christian figure. Uh, we, we trace at least a part of him back to St. Nicholas in the uh, fourth century, a Greek bishop. And uh, he was famous for going around to uh, some of these homes like Faith House that would prevent women from being in, in prostitution. And he would anonymously give bags of gold to, to these people. And, uh, and one night the secret Santa was caught. And, and so that's where, uh, at least in part, we trace back to our, our story of, of Santa. And, and the Santa figure, he, he's somebody who, um, we, we, you know, he resembles the wise men in that. He was, he was kind of resembling that with, with the gold, the wise men who, who visit, King, uh, visit Jesus and, and his parents there in the Christmas story. And Frank and I were talking about this earlier, that, that as you study the Christmas story, the wise men actually come to Jesus, not when he's a baby, probably later in life, when he's a toddler. We think of little Leanna. Is Leanna back there? Or did she leave? <laughs> she, she tapped out already. Uh, but Leanna's probably, what, 18 months, two years old? And, and we think of baby Jesus at about that age, when the wise men uh, show up. And, you know, I mean, wouldn't that be something to see? I wonder, you know, you, ha you have these older, dignified traveling figures and they fall down and worship this baby, this child in diapers. Uh, what kind of personality did Jesus have? I don't know. Was he shy, hiding behind his mother's leg? Or was he um, energetic and distracted, running around? Or maybe that curious kid, you know, going through all the Magi stuff and <laughs> asking them 20 questions. Yeah, I don't even know if he was speaking by then. You know, as they bow down to the toddler and give him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, is Jesus wondering, like, where are the toys? <laughs> or is he looking at the shiny gold mesmerized by it? I don't know. But there's something more important than the Magi's presence that inspire our own gift giving. We give gifts out of recognition of the greatest gift given to us, the person of Jesus. Isaiah 9, 6 says, to, as Chuck read, for us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And of course, John three sixteen, for God loved the world in this way. He gave us his son. Romans six twenty three for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And then lastly, Ephesians 2, 8, uh, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. So in Christmas, we give gifts because we receive the greatest gift. And like any gift, to be a gift, it has to be free. If it's not free, it's now a transaction, not a gift anymore. Uh, Jesus is a free gift to us. We can't earn it or deserve it or take credit. But even if it's free, the value of this present is off the charts astronomical, uh, massive. The price tag of this gift says at least three things about us, or th three things to us. And some of these things are uncomfortable, uh, things that require great humility to accept. So we're going to look at the problem revealed, the strings attached, and the value placed. So first, the problem revealed. 
Have you, have you ever gotten a gift that you didn't really want? I remember growing up, pretty much all I wanted for Christmas was weapons. <laughs> BB guns, uh, you know, knives, slingshots, machetes, you know, <laughs> these kinds of things. Tells you a little bit about what kind of kid I was. But my grandparents, they would just get me socks and underwear and polos. And I'm just thinking, like, what gives? Like, my wardrobe is fine. What more does a seven-year-old need than basketball shorts and a cutoff? You know what I mean? And, and, and why do you need more than one pair of socks and underwear anyways, you know? <laughs> this was before I took interest in girls. But <laughs> Now, sometimes gifts are more difficult to receive for other reasons. For example, what if you open your stocking tomorrow, to, uh, tomorrow you pull out a, a stick of, of deodorant, and it says, please use now, <laughs> right? Or imagine you open your first gift tomorrow from a spouse or a friend. It's a beautiful gift. It looks like a book, a nice bow, and you open it up, and, and to your dismay, it's a dieting book, <laughs> how to lose weight fast. And then you open a gift from another friend, and it's a book, too, entitled Overcoming Selfishness. And then maybe you give me a gift, and it's another book, and, and it says something like, Preaching for Dummies, <laughs> How to Not Have Boring Sermons. If you got me one of those, uh, you can go with Frank to Sunny Valley. <laughs> I'll give you a free pass. What's so difficult about these kinds of gifts? Right? The, these gifts point out problems in us, don't they? And to thank someone for such a gift is to subtly acknowledge that your critique of me is true, that I am stinky and selfish and boring. <laughs> and for this reason and many others, sometimes receiving the gift is more difficult than giving one. So some of us have trouble receiving help from others. Maybe you've been in a situation where you were struggling financially and, and, and someone found out and offered you a lot of money. Isn't that a gif difficult gift to take? Uh, it requires a great deal of humility to receive. And, and the Christmas gift is like that. Uh, it reveals that I am more flawed than I realize. Uh, like the deodorant, like the diet book, like the financial help, Jesus as gift reveals our sinful, needy condition. 1 John 4, 9 says, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You know, some people think of Jesus as just an inspiring moral teacher, and he's certainly not less that. But what does John say about Jesus in verse 10? He says he's our atoning sacrifice for our sins. That this little baby who we adore in the manger is headed to the cross. He's headed to death for us, born to die as we sing. Now, if Jesus could have just saved us by being a good example, he would have. In the garden the night before his death, Jesus cries out in anxiety and anguish, God, if there's any other way, is there any other way? Can I save the world? Can I be a gift to the world without dying for the world? But not my will. Father, yours be done. If this is the only way to save them, I'll do it. So Jesus does go to the cross as the only way to bring the kind of healing and restoration that we all need. There has never been a gift more humbling than Jesus because he reveals th that, that I cannot save myself, that I can't pull myself together and live a good moral life by his standards. Christmas means we're so lost, so unable to save ourselves, that nothing less than the death of God himself can save us. So to truly accept the Christmas gift, we have to admit that we're sinners, deeply flawed, in need of a savior. We have to give up control of our lives to receive him. So receiving the gift is to acknowledge that I deeply need the gift. And then there's another uncomfortable truth about this gift. And that's the strings attached. You ever feel like when you're getting a gift, there's certain strings attached to that gift? Right? There's no such thing as a free lunch. And this is especially true as the gift gets more and more valuable. So, you know, imagine if your boss buys you a Corvette for Christmas. You might be wondering, like, did he join the mafia? What's he going to ask of me? You, know, you would be nervous. 
or back to the money example. Say you are struggling financially and someone finds out and offers you a lot of money, and, but, but maybe you, you're not, you don't take it be, because you don't want to be in that person's debt. Uh, you don't want to have any strings attached to that person. You'll feel like you owe them something, particularly as the gift gets larger and larger. Now, to clarify, Jesus as gift is 100% free. We can't earn it or deserve it. It's pure kindness, pure grace, unmerited favor. However, this gift does come with strings attached. Uh, these aren't manipulative, manipulative strings or selfish strings. They're good strings. They're relational strings. So, for example, when I married my wife six months ago, I wasn't bothered by the strings. We made a covenant to give ourselves romantically only to each other until death separates us. Why? Well, because the value and magnitude of her gift to me, her entire self, is worth the lost opportunities for others. So I'm happy to bind myself exclusively to her. Tim Keller, a pastor in New York, recounts a conversation he had with someone in his church about this idea. A woman came up to him after church, kind of knew she'd been you know, in church for a while as a kid, but came back, and she tells him, you know, growing up, I heard that God accepts us only if we're sufficiently good enough. But at this church, this message is new to me, that, that we can be accepted by God only because of Jesus' work on the cross, despite anything we do or have done. And here's where it gets interesting. She continues. She says, that's a scary idea. A good scary, but still scary nonetheless. So Tim Keller is kind of intrigued. Why is it scary that salvation is a free gift? And she replies, and I put this quote on the screen because it was so good, it hit me. She says, if I'm saved by my good works, there could be a limit to what God could ask of me uh, and put me through. I would be like a taxpayer with rights. I would have done my duty and would deserve a certain quality of life. But if it's really true that I'm a sinner saved by grace alone, at God's infinite cost, then there's nothing he cannot ask of me. Wow. In other words, she began to realize that Christianity isn't just about being a good person. It's about being bought with a price, the infinite price of Jesus's death and how because of it, we belong to him. We're his. See, the value of Jesus as gift certainly reveals some uncomfortable truths that I have a sin problem, that my life is not my own and I belong to him. But it also, third and finally, reveals the incredible worth and value that he places on us. See, the value of the gift shows how much God values the recipient of the gift. God was eager to make the purchase. Jesus joyfully gave his life out of his great value for you. The joy set before him. Picture a vintage car in the junkyard in real bad shape. Uh, but someone wise can see what that car is worth. And, and what it's meant to be. And at great cost to that person, uh, they, they can renew the car and fix it and make it look nice and drive it around back to the 50s night. And Jesus too sees our condition, but he also recognizes what we could be, what we were meant to be. He sees our value. He made us and then he buys us back. Uh, as one song put it, two wonders here that I confess, my worth and my unworthiness, my value fixed, my ransom paid at the cross. So it's very ironic. Christmas reveals our condition as sinners, but also our value as people made in God's image. Maybe you've never thought of this before, but do you recognize that God valued humanity so much that he became one of us? That he became one of us. God values you and I and the entire world so much that he literally became human. Romans 5, 8, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. So we are more flawed than we realize, but we're also more loved and valued and accepted than we could have ever dared hope. And there's this sense in which this gift comes with installments. Uh, Jesus in the manger is the down payment. And the Holy Spirit in our hearts is, is like a, another uh, security deposit. And on Sunday, we're going to talk about the return of the king uh, when Jesus comes back and the gift is fully realized as his kingdom's fully established. So I'm going to ask the worship team to sing one more song for us. We're going to sing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. 
And, and we're singing it with thanksgiving for what's happened in the past and with a longing for what's happening in the future. Let's pray. Incarnate God, with the angels we sing and glorify your name. Thankful for all you've given us. But today we're especially grateful for the gift of your son who gave up his heavenly home for a manger and a cross that we might experience redemption, a gift that'll never spoil or fade. We'll never throw this gift away, Lord. Father, we pray that tomorrow and, and today would be a day of joy in you, your gifts and, and enjoying those we love. Lord, comfort those who are hurting or missing loved ones this weekend. And we pray all this in the name of the one who became human and dwelt among us, Jesus the King. Amen.